Um, and I want to give uh, a talk about um, a couple of different settings, a couple of different theorems. So here, as the title suggests, I want to talk about um, a particular singular space. So this is very much like what I was saying in my very first lecture, that either you sort of think of large classes of singular spaces that um, might come up in various things like sort of abstractions and things, or you deal with a very particular space and you can have to deal with whatever complications it presents you. And this is an example of the following sort. So this is joint work with uh, Andras Bashi and uh, Vishen Pi and uh, Bernard Miller. I need to spend a few minutes giving you a, uh, a bit of a background on it. And for um, various reasons, I want to give this setup and describe our experiment methods, but uh, perhaps fairly briefly. Uh, the, the work itself, um, well, I'll describe why I'm saying less about it and more as we go along. So let me tell you what the singular space is. It's a very famous one, uh, and it goes back to the uh, in some sense or another. So you take a compact or animal surface, so this is you know, your favorite and old, you know, old gamma old uh, torus, uh, compact, closed, or animal. And uh, so various uh, interest groups are interested in various structures on, on such surfaces. So complex structures, conformal structures, or hyperbolic methods, these are all equivalent to one another. This is really classical. Uh, and of course, uh, if you just look at, let's say, the space ball hyperbolic metrics, it's infinite dimensional. I mean, they're all equivalent to one another. Uh, but there's a gauge action, so I can sort of take a set of all different orbits. Now, for those of you who are more about gauge theory, you have to specify your metrics of what regularity and modding out by different orbits of what regularity. And I will neglect those issues for the purposes of this discussion. Okay, so I'm going to let C be the space of all such structures, and then I'm going to. Uh, one out instead of diffeomorphisms. So there's two relevant types of diffeomorphisms. Uh, so you can take div zeros, and these are diffeomorphisms which you can untwist amongst the family of diffeomorphisms back to the identity. So in the group of all diffeomorphisms, it's the cat component of the identity. Okay? And diff is all diffeomorphisms. <laughs> and the quotient between these, this is what's in this middle slide here, uh, diff mod diff zero is a discrete group. Okay, so this measures how many components dip of sigma has. Okay. So if you haven't played around with this, it's a little bit confusing, but you can take a surface and uh, find diffeomorphisms which somehow really move around the surface topologically, which you cannot deform back in its, in its maps to the identity. Okay, so that's that's what this mapping class group is, is measuring, is how, what's the difference between these two things. So, there are two rather famous objects. I take the space of all conformal structures, modulo div zero, or modulo the full diffeomorphism. Okay? <laughs> this is a thing that people commonly think about. This is called type number space. And R sub gamma is its quotient by the mapping class group. So R gamma is the quotient of conformal structures by all diffeomorphisms, but I can sort of first mod out by div zero and then mod out by div mod div zero. Okay? So there's an analogy here, which is a rather strong analogy. It's more than just sort of some late night reverie, which is that this is very much like H2 mod SL2Z. And, and it has a lot of similarities in the following way. First of all, it's now a rather classical fact that the type of space happens to be a finite dimensional ball. So it's a six gamma minus six dimensional ball. And it has a lot of structure on it. It has a complex structure, it's a Taylor handful, it has various natural metrics, which I'll be discussing. But in particular, I mean, it's very reasonable to think of it as kind of like hyperbolic space. Not any necessarily hyperbolic two space, but hyperbolic six gamma minus six space. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the mapping class group is a discrete group. It acts uh, properly discontinuously. There's some, you know, there's some points where there's six points, but uh, it's, you know, by and large, it's a free action. And it's very much like the action of modular. Okay. Now, this kind of analogy, thinking of the Riemann modular space as the set of uh, as, as this quotient of uh, a ball modular discrete group is very fun. Um, now, I should say before I continue on with the structure, why are people interested in these things? And there are a lot of different reasons. I mean, for classification reasons. So, in geometric analysis, you're interested in the space of all hyperbolic metrics. Uh, you know, this, so, this is you know, this um, if you think that there's a lot of flexibility in hyperbolic structures in, uh, in two dimensions. In three dimensions, hyperbolic structures are discrete. I mean, there's lots of them. There's discrete objects. It's somehow a little bit harder to get your hands on. <coughs> and similarly, in higher dimensions, it becomes sparser. Sort of, it's harder and harder to construct uh, uh, compact hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, so in two dimensions, you have sort of a very rich class. Now, uh, this type of spaces and moduli spaces come up a lot in 
uh, classification of in algebraic geometry. It comes up a lot in string theory and other parts of mathematical physics. So for those, you know, if you are a fearless physicist, you try to, you know, take the volume and space of all 50 morphisms and then use sort of various normalizations. And at the end of the day, the constant that appears in your formula is the volume of modular space. <coughs> so these actually appear as some interesting uh, formulas and objectives in physics. Uh, so um, people have been thinking a lot about the structure of the space bar Sophiana. What is cohomology range? So there's, let me just tell you sort of that classically people worry about, you know, what does it look like? Or some work on what does it look like? Is it a singular space or is it an algebraic geometric object? Is there some more theory results in that? That great has been a huge amount of work over the past 20 years inspired by conjectures from physics about what is its cohomology range. And people have been able to understand things like what is its volume and so on. And now people are going on to understand things like what is the geodesic flow. All of which is with respect to a particular natural metric, which I'm going to describe for the baby uh, And this is a canonical type of metric which appears on many types of modular spaces. Uh, and as I pointed out, I'm not going to describe any of these other, but there's various metrics that people have studied, uh, including the Finsler metrics, which are, you know, Finsler is the bond on space reminding me of the a Bonhoeff metric on each, uh, just a norm on each tangent space rather than anything above it. In any case, the, the Bay Peterson metric is one I want to describe. And, we'll to that. <laughs> and it, you get it the following way. So you think of any point in moduli space or type of space, you know, one is just the cover of the other, as a hyperbolic metric, modular diffeomorphisms. But you have the surface and you have the particular metric on it. So that's a point in moduli space. Okay? And to understand what a Metric is, you need to say, what's, what does metric do tangent vectors? So what are tangent vectors in the space of, to the modulus space? Well, I'm looking at infinitesimal deformations of the metric. So if I take a metric and deform it, I get a two tensor, a symmetric two tensor. And there's uh, a theory which tells you that the, the, the tangent space to the space of hyperbolic metrics can be identified with the so-called uh, transverse traceless tensors. So these are symmetric two tensors which are uh, traceless, they have, you know, that is on the value of is zero, and the divergence of it is zero. So these are good candidates. So first of all, saying that you are traceless means that you're, in some sense, uh, you have the space of conformal diffeomorphisms, the space of conformal factors, and you're, you know, it's like you're normalizing the area. So you know, if you have hyperbolic metrics, they all have the same area. So saying that you satisfy this condition means that your tangent metrics are the same area. And satisfying this condition means you're orthogonal to the action of the Okay? So uh, this is the tangent space, and then here's what the metric is. What you do is you want to say you have two tensions of the sort which represent infinitesimal ways of pushing one hyperbolic metric towards another hyperbolic metric. What you do is something that looks like this topology. You take these two tensors, which are just tensors on your surface sigma, take their pointwise anaphotic with respect to the hyperbolic metric that you have, and integrate that over the surface. That's a number. Okay. So that's the Bay Peterson metric, and that tells you if you take these two objects thought of as sort of global objects on the surface, that's how to get it, how to cook up a number. Okay. So this is kind of a, I call a meta object. You have the surface, and then you have the space of all metrics on it, and then you have tangent to, you know, tangent vectors to the space of all metrics, and you're doing some uh, construction like this to get numbers. So this is the Bay Peterson metric, and it descends to the modular space. So this metric has been around and studied for a long time. It has a lot of nice properties. It's negatively curved, it's k ordered it's complex structure, and so on. But it has a lot of rather unpleasant properties. It's not uniformly negatively curved. Curvatures tend to minus infinity in some directions, and it's not a complete metric. So, but it's not that it's not complete. It's complete in some directions and not complete in others. So it's pivotal. Um, when you descend to modulus space, it becomes sort of much simpler. In some sense, that modulus space has a uh, it's finite diameter, and uh, metric compactification is uh, an object that had been understood a long time ago by Dean Humphrey and Alfred Geometry. Uh, and so this is the singular space that I've used. So there's a complex structure on this space. I want to tell you a bit what it looks like, but let me give you some sort of uh, uh, basic structural property. So it's, it's a Kähler uh, metric on a complex space, and it's on the regular part. Um, and in fact, you can even make a case that the singular set is sort of an analytic singular set. This is a stratified space, and the strata are rather simple. They look like divisors, so complex hypersurfaces, which intersect one another. So the picture of that 
basically what they might take away is that you have some sort of space and you have a bunch of singularities along complex hypersurface plots. This is called the and here's sort of the metric description. The debate here is the metric description we call crossing the cusp edge similarities on these divisors. This is sort of a bit of an artificial term. But what it means to suggest is the following. So along the divisor, it's very much like these edges we've been talking about on Noxium for the past several days, a couple of days. Right? But if you look in the transverse direction, it's not looking like a cone. It's looking like a cusp. Okay? And so this is a worse singularity. You might agree with the cusp of the point that you know, comes in very sharply. It's incomplete. They're harder analytically some of you, not others, from cones. But you have roughly what looks like a product of a, co uh, of a cusp cross in the space in that direction. And when these divisors cross, it looks like products of cusps. Okay? Crossed with, you know, another Euclidean space that looks like what's happening at the intersection. So, you know, it's it's a rather um, different sort of thing. Yeah? Before you do that, I just have a little question about that over there. So, doesn't, before we do this connectification, doesn't our original singular Smooth yeah, but they're, they're very minor. These are sort of the major things. Right? So, what are those other ones like? Calm. Kind of, but you do have those sort of built into them somehow. But, you know, cones are critical, right? <laughs> we know what to do with cones. That's not our, that's not our problem. So, no, yes, I mean, there are. Okay, so um, we discussed the iterated edge metrics uh, uh, two lectures ago. And uh, we thought of these as being well, just products of a cone cross the Euclidean space, or fibers of you know, fiber over the fibers of cones. So here we have metrics of the following sort, the R squared plus R 2K times the metric on the cross section. And in fact, since the cross section is two dimensional, uh, you know, the cross section is two dimensional, this H is just a metric on a circle. So they're just d theta squared. So you have dr squared plus R 2K times d squared. Okay? And then plus the next uh, so this is what a cusp edge metric looks like, and for many purposes, there's no harm in just letting that cross section be any compact band rather than just a circle. Yeah. However, we have to sort of think what happens in the directions. The case that naturally comes up with the big piece metric is this: the R squared plus part of the six H, so K is equal to three. And there's something that was discovered in the course of this work I'll be describing, which is that you know you can write down these for any K bigger than one, and in fact. If you look at the problems I'll be describing, when k is bigger than 3, in a certain sense they're easier. When k equals 3, which is somehow the geometrically natural case, is part of its borderline case. So, you know, that's, I don't know why that is now, but that's what actually happens. Is that 6 the same 6 as the k in 6 Probably not. Well, let me see. Is it, um, no, that 6 is 23. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me see. I don't think it's the same as that. Um, no, it definitely is because it's just local along the class. No, it definitely is. Different numbers to different characters. Um, so uh, the point is exactly what I described. So here's a description of the baby here symmetric, at least sort of at rough level, is that at a single point, L is equal to 1, and so I just have a single cusp across the Euclidean space. And then the rather remarkable thing that happens is that at points of intersection, this uh, looks almost like a probably like an orthogonal quad. This thing splits into this bunch of little quadrants. Now, there's actually sort of a nice geometric reason behind that, uh, which I'll see a bit later. But this makes life very simple. Now, the history about the form of this metric is, is um, kind of interesting. So, uh, Howie Mazur discovered the very uh, you know quasi-isometric form of this a long time ago in the seventies, and Scott Wolfer. Wolfert, Michael, and uh, Sumi Yamada had a variety, in, uh, a variety of sort of difficult and very interesting important papers where they refined the structure of its metrics so that they got the structure looking like this for the remainder terms up to second or third order. For applications that we eventually like to do down the road, you'd actually like to know that the metric is smooth or polyhomogeneous if you go towards the single set. Now, this is something that probably any of these guys could have done, but never did because that question was irrelevant. But if you're interested in, let's say, understanding the higher order key asset, uh, you need to know that metric is a lesson about the expansion. So I'm um, working on trying to write that down. And it's um, you know, harder than I thought, but I think that all the ideas fundamentally are these papers Okay, so this asymptotic expansion, this sigma here, um, this uh, 
similarity here is really the level of full polyhomogeneous, full polyhomogeneous expansion. So what are the theorems that one would like to prove? Well, so we're taking a philosophy which is extraordinarily artificial, which is that anything you do on modulized space is bound to be interesting eventually. Uh, and, you know, there's some truth in that, but you know, we could be wrong. But um, as I said, people have been studying sort of more primitive objects in the cohomology ring, volumes, well, G as a flow is a very uh, more intricate thing from some point of view, but really uh, that sort of understanding uh, analysis on modulus it hasn't been undertaken. And, uh, so what are some of the problems that one might ask? Well, ultimately there are some interesting things uh, that one might understand. So index formulas, the most primitive one of which is the Gaussian A formula, and the SD Yao and, uh, and uh, some collaborators wrote uh, a couple of papers uh, several years ago where it, it was very difficult to solve the computation, but they were able to show that uh, the gauss a theorem, which is that the Euler characteristic of modulized space is equal to the integral of the following over this respect of figures. <coughs> and that's very, uh, that, that formula has had some interesting applications. Um, slightly uh, different than <coughs> the gauss and a formula is understanding that these spaces tell two harmonic forms, the modulus, uh, you know, and this actually turns out by a certain structure theory that's developed by Sutter and various other people. So let's say we wrote a short paper on this a number of years ago, and you can actually understand the, the um, space of uh, L2 differential forms, uh, harmonic differential forms, and it's fairly um, readily in terms of other uh, modules. But uh, an important open question, which is still open, is to understand signature theorems. So this is a theorem I wrote down in the very first lecture that the uh, signature, which is a topological object, is equal to the integral of a certain curvature. The, the, the L class, uh, maybe plus some boundary contribution, some sort of data or something like that. So I think a lot of people are interested to see if that happens, uh, and uh, we don't know. So what uh, G. Andor and Andrash are trying to do is to you know, start a more general program of just here is a class of singular spaces which we're presented with in nature, and we'd like to understand how to develop techniques which are uh, uh, sufficient for this. <coughs> We're starting with step one, just the scalar Laplace, which is already a challenge. So here's a question that I uh, will go over fairly briefly because it's been covered in a couple of uh, different lectures at this point, which is we're on an incomplete space. You'd like to know, is there a natural self-adjoint extension of this operator or not? And so I'll remind you of some of these facts about minimal and maximal domains. But that's really the very first question, is that we have this space, we have this higher co-dimensional boundaries in this sort of rather difficult cusp structure here, and we'd like to know, is the Laplacian acting on smooth compact supported functions? Is there a sort of unique way to extend that to a self geometry? Once you have that, then you can talk about problems in spectral geometry. You know, what's the, you know, is the spectrum discrete? Does it, how is it sort of statistically distributed? What is lambda one? You know, all sorts of questions like that. Okay? Uh, so, here I ask. Um, Okay, so this is a uh, um, set of things. Where we are now is really just to study the scale of Laplace. So here's a theorem that I wanted to uh, discuss some techniques about. Uh, so the claim is that, in fact, it is essentially self-adjoint. And uh, it's a uh, self-adjoint operator. It has discrete spectrum. And the eigenvalues do what you'd expect as if there was a person in the name. Now, this last theorem is not maybe such a huge shock. Uh, there's a lot of work on spectral asymptotics. If I take a general domain that has and other complicated things. There's a fair amount known about spectral asymptotics. So if I take a domain that has, uh, you know, it's not just Lipschitz, but it has sort of um, older cusp type behavior the boundary, uh, there's actually a lot of work now on the bioasymptotic formula uh, on such things. So the bioasymptotic formula is what tells you that, uh, I write this down later, it counts the number of eigenvalues and of lambda, which is the number of j such that lambda j is less than tries to estimate or find a uh, uh, you know, find some sort of asymptotic information about this function in lambda. It's a, it's a piecewise discontinuous function because every time lambda crosses an eigenvalue, it jumps up. It kind of understands where this overall growth is. And so for domains with cusps and so on, there's a lot known not only about the leading term of the asymptotic expansion, but if you look at Victory uh, you know, 2008 book, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure that there are many so, I mean, a lot's known about domains with very irregular boundaries and, and low order terms in the wildlife, or at least estimates for, for 
Okay, so here's something that I uh, um, uh, pointed out that we've been talking about already. So on, which is what does essential subjoinness mean? <coughs> Why do we do this fact? And if I take uh, compactly supported functions supported away from the singular set, I take the graph of these, right? I get some sort of fuzzy subspace sitting inside L2 cross L2. I can take its closure, it's still the graph of some function, and it's a function defined only on some still densely defined subspace inside L2, which is you know, strictly bigger than C infinity zero, but strictly smaller than L2. Okay, so I have this graph of set of all u common velocity of wp of u, where u lives in this minimal domain. And that's a closed subspace L2 plus L2. And I can ask, uh, how, how does that compare to the so-called maximal domain, which is the set of all u and L2 such that the Laplacian is in L2. Where here, I'm construing the Laplacian in the broadest sense possible. I compute it, you know, not distributionally at the, at the corner at the divisors, but I compute it uh, in any way I want to the root part. And there's enough cancellation from all the growth of view at the boundaries so that the Laplacian is still there. So it's always true that the minimal domain is in the maximal domain. And the theory, which we've heard about a few times already, is that it's the quotient of this uh, which measures how many self adjoining extensions you have. And so, in particular, this property being essentially self adjoining which is this question is Dmax. Okay, and what that means in down to earth language is that if you have a function u and l2 whose Laplacian is in then you can approximate it in graph form. It means you find a sequence of extremely nice functions, uj, smooth, compact, and supported, such that uj converges to u and l2. You can always do that because u is an l2 function, but so that the Laplacian of uj converges to this gap, this Laplacian of u in the l2 form. Okay, so this is sort of the hard condition of the And uh, so it's a regularity theorem. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about, so I mean, it's going to be back. So, this is what I described um, in lecture two when I was on a cone. I, I described some rudiments of why this is true. And the real issue is, I'd like to say, if I happen to know that you is, so there's an a priori assumption on you that you is an L2, and Laplacian view is an L2, I'd like to say that you is better behaved than just being an L2. So this is a regular. Often, really, you'd like to say that you has some sort of partial asymptotic expansion or something like this. Uh, but what you're really trying to draw is that u decays fast, u decays at some definite rate faster than L2. Okay? The minute that's true, then it's very easy just by multiplication and cutoff arguments to arrange this approximation. So what we're really after here is some sort of a, a regular domain. Now, these types of domains, you know, these things with crossing cusp edges are, are pretty hard and they're pretty far outside the technology of what has been understood by the point of view of any parametric system. Not to say that such experimental standards couldn't be developed, but they have them, certainly. Okay. So uh, in trying to prove just this random primitive property of scalar Laplacian, we resort to techniques that are very non parametric based And uh, so this is what's, I, uh, this is one reason I wanted to talk about this theorem, just to show you some other types of techniques that work. And so this is really sort of a very basic technique in a real analysis, Hardy inequalities. So if you're in a RM, for example, the classical Hardy inequality says, so that I sigma v0, I take r to the minus 2 mod u squared is less or equal to some very specific constant times the beginning of the That's the r and usually constant. And so in fact, what we're looking for is sort of the family of, and I think I can call it back in part of the two sigma or something. So, so there's an extra back in part of the two sigma. Um, so just to give you a sense of the proof, and I, I can't say very much because it's, it's rather an estimate-based proof that, you know, there is intuition in, but it's not a, it's not a completely easy measure of what you to explain a set of ideas. What you do is you, um, you have divide, you have um, radial functions for each divisor. So these are the radii towards, you know, the, the distance of <coughs> the divisor. And you take the powers of these, r1 is the same, r1 is the same, r2 is the same, l. You're interested in proving an estimate like this, and I'll show you how that estimate is going to be used in just a moment. And what you want to derive is first this already estimate, which is really an integration by parts, and then eventually this estimate. Now, this is sort of the, the nub of the matter. This is sort of the rather sort of the best thing. Unfortunately, I didn't rewrite this, so I'm going to show you information on another slide and then come back to this. But let me just parse it a little bit for you. 
So I'm going to have a family of functions. You want to think of these as functions that when delta is positive, they give you a lot of extra decay. Okay, so these functions, C delta of R, uh, are, are decaying rather quickly when delta is positive. Uh, and, and as R goes to zero, as each of these R goes to zero, but as delta goes to zero, it tends to the identity. Okay? So what I'd like to do is to prove a family of estimates like this where these constants are independent of delta. And then uh, the hypothesis of the theorem, we're going to say that this right-hand side is bound in even in delta equal to zero, and that's going to give us then control of these two terms here. What is alpha? Uh, alpha is alpha. Where's alpha? Excuse me? Sigma, yes. <laughs> so sigma is this weight. Okay. Okay, so that's the one thing I'll explain on the other side. So this is an extra an extra weight function that's really sort of imposed by the structure of the operator and it sort of has to be in there. And here's what the specific formula for it is. Um, so bracket R, bracket rho, I take the sum of the inverses inverse. So when and when there's two divisors, it looks like this. So for L equals one, it just looks like R. But for two, it looks like this. Now if you think about what this means. On the picture of the so, if I look at what this weight function looks like, if I have axes that look like this, there's R1 and R2, right? And I take this function of R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2, and I write it in polar coordinates, right? Then I have, so let's like rho cosine theta be R1 and rho sine theta be R2. Then this function is equal to, um, uh, so it's going to be a rho times uh, sine theta times cosine theta divided by the non-vanishing factor sine theta plus cosine theta. So that denominator is pretty relevant. Okay? So what this actually means is that this function is, is really a product of defining function. So theta is equal to pi on 2 here, theta is equal to 0 here, and rho is equal to 0 here. So what I do is I do this blow up, and then I take the product of defining function. So somehow, there's a blow up here, even though we're not really introducing the blow up to do any of the other analysis, that blow up really is there. Any finer analysis or, you know, exact information about the asymptotics of solutions would be here's just crossing what this suggests to the blow up intersection of divisors. Not a completely shocking thing, crossing edges, but there it is. Okay? Um, the other thing to say here, this is exactly what I said, is that this function phi delta of r, it just looks like a product of functions in each of these one-dimensional things. And it has its properties. So there's a scaling here, and we cook it up so that uh, for uh, you know, delta positive, it just introduces an extra vanishing factor. So it gives you something that vanishes a little bit faster. But as I scale away, as I let delta go to zero, this is just converting to the function one. Okay, so let me go back to this estimate here. So what the theorem we eventually prove is, and like I said, I don't want to discuss this in too great detail, but just to give you an idea of the technique, so this is very much an estimate-based proof, rather than something more geometric that I've talked about before, is that one shows by combining the Hardy inequality and various other things, that you can get an estimate like this, that if you assume that this thing is operator controlled independently of delta, then this thing is not. Okay? And that's the kind of thing that we're interested in. If the Laplacian of you is well behaved, then you get that you is better behaved than you thought it. Okay, so that's really the moral I want you to derive from that. Okay, so how this works, like I say, I don't want to, I don't want to go through that. But that's that's sort of the idea, the type of estimates. That we know. And in deriving this, the, the you know, sort of weird thing is that k equals three, the exact case that we need to study. You can't prove exactly this. You have to prove a slightly weaker version of it. It gives you the other same sort of thing. Three, two, three, row, row angle bracket is the same as your r angle bracket. Excuse me. Yeah, so your row angle bracket. Yeah, the rows, yeah, it's a row change from R from one slide to the other. So. Okay, so this is really all that I uh, said, and, and this is really all I want to say about this here. I'm going to move on to another topic, but this was sort of uh, uh, an introduction of a set of techniques that are completely different than what I've tried to talk about before. They're sort of much more constant with certain types of other analytic techniques uh, than we're using elsewhere, but this gives you a regular experiment for functions on this very simple space. So we're able to say that the maximal domain actually lives in a space that has a slight improvement of decay. So anything, so if you start off with u and d max, you just know that u is an L2, but you actually conclude that u has one derivative, that means two derivatives in a certain 
sense, and it actually decays at some specific rate. Okay? That's what this estimate allows you to do. So this is you know, a bit of a story of interpretation, but once you know that D max is contained in the domain like this, then it's a very easy fact that R to the epsilon H1 is contained, is compacted in L2. And then it's a standard exercise that that means that if the maximal domain is contained in there, then uh, in fact, you can do two things. One is that you can approximate anything in the maximal domain by the minimal domain. It says that you sort of remove the barrier from approximating things by compacting supported things. And the other thing is, is that the corresponding self adjoint operator is possible. So this is meant to be just a little taste of a sort of a rather different take on everything. Um, but so this is uh, pretty much what I want to say about this. I'm going to move on to something else in this moment. Uh, I want to finish up by uh, just mentioning that, so the proof of vital estimates, well, I already mentioned, you can see that was on a previous piece of paper. But you know, for rough domains, people have already pretty good techniques of counting functions for counting eigenvalues for uh, for uh, um, uh, to make the boundary or cut the boundary, so on. And there's this technique of what's called here, Schleim Roman bracketing, which is um, really goes back to our environment. It's really essentially the original proof of our uh, And uh, basically, what you want to show is that this paper I had here. Uh, basically, what you want to show is that there's somehow not really any big eigenvalue concentration, any big eigenvalue concentration of eigenvalue cusps. So what's happening there? Eigenvalues or eigenfunctions may be concentrating there, but somehow at a much lower rate. Okay, so that's really the point you need to control. If you want to say that sort of the rate of eigenfunction concentration near the boundary is lower. Okay, so just a uh, last few comments about this. That this is a classical argument is probably really overstating it. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a very modern argument in some ways, inspired by uh, a lot of work that Andrash had done before. Uh, but uh, it, it does not involve any of these parametric constructions and analysis or other points of view. Uh, if we had sort of the full parametrices that sort of hinted at one and constructed the edge and iterated edge cases, um, one would be able to obtain a lot more out of it. Yet this is a very, you know, this argument gives you exactly. What you know. And when I say minimal amount of information, this is again sort of overly, you know, this is overly, uh, I mean, it gives us a fair amount of information. The problem is that if we want to go on to do differential forms and you know, the Hodgkin velocity and so on, this sort of will definitely need more information. Than this. So this is sort of just enough information to handle the scale of the velocity and the velocity. Okay, so. Uh, Maybe I should sort of point out that you know this issue of you know a priori estimates versus parametrices. You know the, this sort of duality runs through a huge amount of PDE, but certainly PDE on uh, singular spaces. Um, that any time that you have a parametric, so an inverse or an approximate inverse, it gives you estimates. So it's the statement that the parametric is bounded in certain function space, which gives you a lot of estimates. Okay. On the other hand, if you learn Pruner, everything is about a priori estimates, and you never see essentially parametric systems. Okay. They're really the same as one or the other. And uh, you know, I would say become more neutral in my opinion as I've gotten older about you know whether one is superior to the other. They're just some are more appropriate in some circumstances than others. And you know, Andrew should certainly talk a huge amount about the uh, use of things like loss of energy. Like that, which are not parametric space, but are extraordinarily powerful. Okay, so um, that was meant to be a preview. Uh, so, as I said, there are other open problems, and you know, even understanding the essential self adjoints of the Hodgkin velocity seems to be much more subtle. We want to understand issues about the heat kernel, which will require understanding the higher asymptotic symmetry. You know, as I hinted, there's a huge amount of uh, activity now going on about geodesics on how uh, modular space is actually a workshop at the uh, Math Institute here at Stanford uh, this June about specifically exactly that topic of geodesic on modular space. And hooking that up with the wave kernel in this space I think is a really important problem. I think that's a long ways off. Nobody's done anything quite like that yet. It's, uh, it's probably a rather important direction. Okay, so um, as I intended, I left about and I, I made sort of this uh, editorial choice, which perhaps was a poor one. 
But uh, so I had a, a couple things I wanted to discuss in the remainder of the lectures, and they were too much to fit in uh, one lecture and too little to fit in two lectures. So I thought I'd split up one of the topics between this afternoon and tomorrow. So um, forgive me for doing all this. Uh, I'm not going to use the ball at all. Uh, there were a couple of things that I wanted to talk about, and I'll explain why. So the theorem that I, I want to talk about here are uh, some nonlinear problems in stratified spaces. And I want to talk about two different problems. Today I want to give uh, a talk about a theorem that's uh, sort of a very general theorem on arbitrary stratified spaces. It's a nonlinear problem, which is the Imani problem, which I'll recall for you. And I'll get started on describing it, and I may need to finish up this discussion uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to be talking in sort of great detail about sort of uh, a very delicate problem in complex geometry. Um, about long term equations on manifolds and edges. So it sounds a bit far fetched, but there was actually a very specific uh, problem in complex geometry that, that needed this, and I'll try to sort of motivate that as well. So the difference between these two nonlinear problems and everything I've talked about before is well, they're nonlinear, and I just want to show you that you can do a certain amount of work in nonlinear analysis on these spaces. Uh, this Yamabe problem is specifically, uh, you know, I think. Why I, I like the result is because it works sort of in this general stratified set. Okay, so we're able to handle uh, the theorem you know, without regard to how bad the system effects are. Uh, the other theorem about the linear pair equation you know, is really the limit of our abilities using all the information I know about manifolds with simple edges. So that's sort of a very high tech theorem. Okay, so I want to review today, and maybe I'll only do the review of the compact case, we'll see one more time. So what is the standard Imami problem? So this is you know, a famous problem in, in, in nonlinear analysis. So this is the PDE, and there's a geometric problem behind it. So it's the analog of the, so this ties in with the Riemann surface case in hyperbolic metrics. Uh, you know, if I have a metric, I'd like to conformally change it to a new metric, which has constant curvature. Okay? Now, if, uh, you know, in two dimensions, this is you know, a spectacularly useful, wonderful theorem called the uniformization. In higher dimensions, if you just allow yourself the flexibility of changing by a conformal factor, then you can attain only the weakest type of constant curvature. It's called constant scalar curvature. So it's the average of all the section curvatures. And you know that the other problem um, turns. So as I'll explain now, this this uh, reduces to the following partial differential equation. So I take the Laplacian for this background metric. There's a purely dimensional constant c event. Rg0 is the scalar curvature of the initial metric. And what I'm trying to do is find a solution of the semi-linear elliptic problem where that R sub g is constant. I don't care what constant it is, I just want to solve it with some constant. So it's like an eigenvalue problem. Okay. Now, the solution to this in the context of the case is understood completely. And it was actually one of the big triumphs of geometric analysis about 20 years ago. It was a very long story, uh, which I'll relate to part of it. It was a very important theorem. Now, this the result has had very few geometric consequences. Now, we're probably overstating it, but I think that what this, uh, the, the method of solution of this problem has turned out to be extraordinarily useful for the study of, the purely analytic study of semi linear problems. For the simple reason that the, the solution is somehow intensely geometric, and if you didn't approach this problem from the point of view of geometry, you never would have found the solution. Well, but, uh, you know, how useful are constant scalar curvature metrics in geometric classification? Probably not very. Now, they're interesting in geometry, but they're not as useful as what's more. Einstein, sorry. Okay, but what we want to do is, starting with G-naught, we want to find a positive function that satisfies this PD. So there's a purely analytic problem. And this equation is actually the order of one equation for an energy. So it's not so hard to see that if you find a critical point for this energy here, uh, that will actually be a solution. And because you want the u, I mean, the u multiplies the metric, I'd like u to strictly positive everywhere. I'd like to find a minimum of this energy. Okay, so this was the method that Imam proposed about 1961 or so, years ago. Long time ago. And he set up a scheme for proof. Uh, so you'd like to find the minimizer for this energy. And, well, you know, we've already seen a few examples of this during this conference already. It shouldn't be so hard to minimize the energy, one would think. What makes this hard is exactly this number two and number minus two. So there's kind of a funny uh, transition that if I were to take any power less than two and over n minus two, this would be a simple problem, and that's exactly what you're talking about. And 
where p equals 2 n over n minus 2 becomes a very subtle problem, and when p is greater than that, it's impossible. So there's some transition to that. And what the phase shift right then is, is the issue of an embedding of, a, of h1, the solo space h1, inside the LP spaces, where p less than or equal to 2 n over n minus 2, so this is the solo embedding. Okay, so what we'd like to do is find a minimizer for this energy, and Here's what the geometers discovered over a series of you know, great accomplishments, is that if you try to minimize the sequence, the direct method of the calculus of variations, is that you try to find a sequence of functions which get whose values, q of u and uj, closer and closer to the minimum value, ideally you'd like to say that you have enough information to show that they converge to a new function. And once they converge, then that function has to be a minimizer. That's sort of the dream situation. However, it's very easy to construct examples here where the uj's have q of uj converging to the minimum value, but they themselves don't converge. They, they sort of form bubbles. So they start blowing up wildly at isolated points. Okay. So this is now a very uh, well understood phenomenon, and this sort of issue of bubbling has been observed in many other related equations, often equations that come out of geometry and kind of physics, because they have this order of nature. So I pointed out the issue is exactly that by the W12, the solo space H1, it embeds the LP for P less than or equal. But at this value, the, uh, you know, the inclusion is only continuous but not compact. So what um, <coughs> if one can somehow show that the UJs converge, then you're done. You win. So the problem is, can you find a sequence of, uh, of functions UJ? So here's your number of still in this new manifold. Okay, so here's our smooth manifold. And can you find a sequence of functions that are everywhere staying down? And here's sort of the bad scenario, that there's some point where the graph of the function is somehow equal. So everywhere else the function is looking nice and smooth, it's converging, but as j goes to infinity, its peak gets bigger and bigger. Okay, that's the disaster. Okay, and here was an old theorem. And this was, so Yamami proposed this proposed scheme, and, and it turned out that this Arguments were uh, been incomplete, and a famous paper of Neil Turner in the late 60s, sharpened by Obama <coughs> some years later, was that if the minimum, so remember this y of mg naught, this is the minimum, uh, the minimum of this value here. So I'm taking this <coughs> value of g. If this is less than some universal dimensional constant, so the, the minimum on the sphere. So you know, if I'm in n dimensions, here's just a number I can compute. That first of all. It's always true that the amount of energy for any manifold is less than or equal to this universal dimensional constant. And if it's actually strictly less than it, then you win. Namely, this minimizing procedure works. Okay, so it's kind of a remarkable theorem. It says that uh, you know, there's something to check. Now, that, here's the problem. That seems like an unchecked condition. You, know, you have this abstract condition. If this infimum is strictly less than this strictly dimensional constant, then this method of the calculus variation is always uh, so, but it was still very important there. The, the analytic technique that goes behind this is the motor iteration technique. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the details of that, but just to point out that you parlay the strict inequality into some sort of operator estimate that bounds, ultimately it's going to bound uh, um, the LP norms of UJ independently of P. So this is kind of one of these things. You take UJ, LP norm, you know, normalize it in a certain way, that. You want to show that that's bound independently of p. You can cast the limit and get that to be the element there. So this is what most iteration allows you to do. This has been used in many instances in, in analysis. And uh, Trudinger was well. This was one of the first really important applications of most iteration. And so here's the problem that I want to describe: is can we do this on singular spaces? So I've told you what happens for smooth manifolds, and my question is: can we do this on singular spaces? And so. There are various motivations that um, Kudagawa and Watkinik were motivated by problems, you know, I should say surgery problems, on smooth compact manifolds. This is very much like the sort of Morsky composition picture that uh, I mentioned in my very first uh, slide. That you can sort of pull out your manifold in sort of simple pieces, and you know that the structure of this constant scalar vector matrix on those that you might need to reconstitute the manifold. So this was part of the motivation. So, here I have a manifold with isolated quantum singularities. We've discussed these at great length. 
And we can define the Imago invariant and ask exactly the same questions. The Q's of G0 is its energy, but we can ask for the question, can we find the critical in this case? Okay. So, um, so is the human Q not realized? Okay, and once it's realized, is the geometry of the thing the same? So just to point out that if you're on a smooth manifold, the manifold has no corners or conic points or anything like that, then the theorem that we <coughs> can deduce from the classical methods is that you, know, you get this limit. Uj tends to some limiting function u because of this uh, uniform infinity estimate. And the function u is a bounded solution to this equation. It's very easy to say that if u is bounded and satisfies this equation weakly, then it's a smooth function. And it's strictly positive everywhere. And so this function, u to the 4 over n minus 2 g naught, well, it sort of changes g naught around in locally uniform ways, but the geometry of it is sort of overall the same. I'm not distorting the, the geometry grossly. But if I'm on a singular space, it could easily happen that the function u tends to infinity or zero. I, I might be able to find a solution for uh, this problem and for the PDE, but the question is, does it have the same asymptotic geometry? So there's sort of a new twist in this problem. Not only do I have to find a solution, but I need some sort of good estimates on things in the And there are several new estimates, uh, several new phenomena here. And uh, the main one I want to point out, well, the first I want to point out is the following kind of bizarre fact, is that if I take the cross-section of the cone, so remember this, these ends are the cross-sections of the conic points. Uh, if these things have negative Yamada energies, this is a sort of an intrinsic feature of a manifold. If these cross-sections have negative Yamada energy, then in fact, the amount of energy of the total space with quantum singularities is negative, you know, the cumulative of the energies is negative. Okay? So here's a rather simple example that there's just a topological, essentially it turns out to be a, a geometric but really a topological instruction to the possibility of this, of this functional even being down and below. Okay, remember we're looking for the infima of this function. Now I was trying to find, so this y, y is the infima of q. Okay? And if the infima is negative infinity, then find a, uh, uh, you know, a function which attains the minimum. So this is kind of a disaster, and this is something that's completely unseen in the smooth case, okay, where, the, where the energy is down below. Okay, so we're going to restrict to the case where the cross, so what that means is that any conic point, there has to be a very special geometry for the cross sections of the cone. So that's exactly what this hypothesis is, and what the Kudu and Bachman proved is that uh, you can do the following thing. So you can say, uh, suppose, so this is an analog of Trudinger's result. It says that suppose that this energy is, the infimum of the energy is strictly finite, so it's greater than minus infinity, but it's strictly less than not just the value of the sphere, this dimensional constant, but one other thing. So the one other thing that you have to avoid is the energy of. Cones. If I just take the cone that goes off to infinity, this is sort of the asymptotic model. If I have a manifold with conic singularities, right? then locally, near that conic point, it's looking on a microscopic scale very much like the entire cone. And so I'll say in just a word that we finished for today, which is the Kudakawa Botkin theorem, described from generalization of this uh, tomorrow morning. But uh, the, the, the theorem is that if this infimum of the energy is finite, but strictly less than the value on the sphere and on this entire cone, then this whole Moser iteration procedure works. That you can find a uh, uniform upper bound for minimizing sequences and you can attain a minimizer. And it has the same asymptotic form. So, this is, uh, let's say, a 10 year old term. It was a very long paper, rather technical. And one of the reasons I got into this was, you know, they were clearly understanding the simplest singular situation. And it was a sufficiently long paper that made you worry that understanding anything more complicated. Fortunately, it turns out that there's a way of looking at what they did in a, in a different way that makes it possible to, um, to handle completely general spaces, in fact, far worse than stratified spaces. So you can do this on a certain extent. Um, so just to say a rough idea of the proof, and this is where I'm going to finish today, a rough idea of the proof is exactly as in the single case. You take a minimizing sequence of this energy, it bounded below, remember that was part of the hypothesis, is that the infimum is, 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 is finite. And you want to say that this uj doesn't have this terrible behavior that it starts both. 
right? And so the point is, is that on a manifold of conic singularities, there's two things that could happen. So here's the manifold of conic singularities, and this is part of the manifold, and this is the, the function of uj, right? This is the graph of uj. So this bump means this bump is the graph of uj. This is the cone point of the manifold. So the two things you want to avoid are as this j goes to infinity, the function uj starts bubbling at some, some interior point away from the conic singularity, and that's exactly what this inequality does. And then the other thing you want to prevent is that it starts bubbling somehow right at the cone point, and that's what this other inequality is. Okay, so once you know those two things, you can uh, uh, prevent bubbling, and then it goes through is, is poor, and you know, it takes a bit of work to do that. That's sort of the end of the story uh, in, in the conic case. So um, the case of equality for smooth manifolds and for uh, cones is quite different. Let me just finish with this today. So in complex smooth manifolds, remember, let me just go back. And this was sort of you know one reason that this became such a famous theorem in the smooth case was so here we go. Remember, Turinger's theorem said that if you have strict inequality, if y if y and g are strictly less than this dimensional constant, then you win. You can find the solution. So now this leads you to worry about when, when, when can you check it? It seems like an uncheckable thing. And here's the remark that I think that there are no great chains in that particular year before. Equality happens if and only if you're already in sphere. So there's exactly one case that equality occurs, and it's one case that you know you already have a solution to the problem, namely the standard ground that you can see. Okay? So it's kind of an amazing thing. There's sort of a very complicated analytic uh, procedure that says that if you have strict inequality, then you can solve this PDE and find a solution. And the only time that criterion breaks down is the one case you know you already have a solution. So it's an amazing thing. So you might hope for a rigidity. And this is sort of you know, the mark of interesting mathematics if you have a nice rigidity statement. Namely, is it true that, uh, excuse me, let me just go back to their result here. Uh, is it true that you have strict inequality here, or else if you have equality, it's a case that you already know you have a solution? That would be the nicest possible scenario. And we're left with sort of a disastrous situation is that there's an intriguing counterexample which says that this is false. So just a couple of years ago, Jeff Bikowski had a paper where he was doing something quite different, but amongst, them, amongst what he did, he actually identified a very simple, specific manifold. So it just is a very well-known space in algebraic geometry uh, that has an isolated conic point, and there's no metric of constant scalar curvature. So there's absolutely no okay. What this manifold looks like, I should say, is um, this piece of paper here. It looks like one of these asymptotic and conic manifolds that I talked about before, but you choose a conformal factor which somehow closes up infinity into a conic point. So I described in my second lecture how you know these things were essentially how these things were essentially conformally related. And so he just took a manifold that's been intensely studied for many applications in various fields, closed it up to a, something with a conic point with a, with a specific conformal factor, and was able to show that it didn't admit metric constant scale approach. Okay? So this is good and bad news in the following sense. It's bad news because it says that there's no characterization of the case of equality apparent because you know, here's a manifold that doesn't admit a solution, and it, it itself does not have constant scale. On the other hand, it's good news, and it suggests that there might actually be a nice theorem that any counterexample, you know, any time you have a quality of energy, you know, that the minimizing energy is exactly this critical value, is a case where somehow the space underlying it is very rigid. There's some sort of special geometry. So that's sort of what we're left with in this isolated conic singularity case. It's sort of the hope that there's going to be an interesting characterization of rigidity. But a uh, number of people thought of this uh, part of the past few years is just a counterexample, and unfortunately, nobody has. So, is there some special geometry underneath? Okay, so I'm going to leave you with this today, um, and I'm going to pick up the rest of the story, uh, namely, how can you generalize this, and in some sense simplify the argument of the discussion quite a bit. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about it tomorrow morning, and then I'll talk about another moment as well.
a to the alternate train formula. Oh, you know, oh, we mean on on a modular space. Yes. Uh, nobody has any idea. Like I say, I mean, people are just getting off the ground understanding what he does and things like that. I, you know, these are exactly the sorts of questions. I mean, you know, it's a great question, and it's the sort of questions that people are just now at the barely able to ask intelligently. In the sense that, you know, there's this analogy, people have now built up enough knowledge about geodesics and other things. Well, until our there, there's no knowledge of sort of the eigenvalues on this, but this is now something that we're going to do. I'd say that something like this is probably ways off, you know, uh, but it's a great question. And probably. Anything else? Yeah. So, I'm sure it's clear that you're going to explain this for a moment, just like you see tonight. So, the nature of the theorem you're going to prove is that you solve the non column generalists. The yeah, analysis sure. ratio is less than some number. Of yeah, the that's exactly right. So there's going to be sort of an explanation for this other number, which I'm going to explain. Right. Some way of explaining. So part of the difficulty of this three-column problem theorem is that you have, you know, y is less than these two possible things, and you know, understanding. You generalize that theorem. Yeah, so we're going to generalize that theorem and sort of explain that constant in that way, and then we have a much simpler proof of what they do. And even now, you know. <laughs> <laughs>